In earlier presentations, we looked at the Rhine River and the Danube River watersheds. Let's look at them in terms of a larger continental perspective. Here are Europe's major watersheds, in German, of course. As we are working with multiple languages, let's add that international linguistic flair. Here is the Danube, or the Danau, running from the Black Forest and the Alps to the Black Sea. And here is the Rhine, running from the Alps to the North Sea. These two watersheds lie next to each other and span a good chunk of Europe, so of course it would make sense to connect them. Unfortunately, we have an obstacle that gets in the way of connecting these two river basins, the Alps. While both river basins start in the Alps, as the river tributaries go ever higher in the mountains, they become ever smaller, until they are just ephemeral streams that run only periodically and do not have enough capacity to carry even a small toy sailboat, let alone a major cruise ship or cargo hauler. Let's say that you are doing the Grand European Tour and wanted to get from Amsterdam to Budapest, two major capitals in Europe, two major industrial areas, and two major cruise port destinations. How do we get from point A in Amsterdam to point B in Budapest? Wow, I did not expect the alphabet to work there. Here is Amsterdam. We fly into Schiphol, or have our product shipped into port, and then it is put on a ship for its voyage. We start our journey by entering the North Sea and going through the English Channel, where we travel into the Atlantic and head south, rounding Portugal and passing Gibraltar as we enter the Mediterranean. As we enter the Med, we cruise along North Africa until we pass around Sicily and Greece, turning into the Turkish Straits as we transit into the Black Sea. From there, we have a quick jaunt across the Black Sea until we get to the mouth of the Danube. And then we head up the Danube until we come to Budapest. As you can see, we have both a river and an ocean voyage on this trip. This means that we have to get off our ocean ship before we head up the Danube, which, if you have a lot of luggage or freight, is going to be a major pain. For most of the history of people in Europe, this was the only way to get to the Rhine River to the Danube River. Well, this, or one could lug your stuff over the Alps. Neither was very convenient. When it comes to connecting watersheds, we have to either lower the barrier between the watersheds or raise the water over the barrier. Back to the Alps, which is the barrier between the Rhine and the Danube. One way to connect these two basins is to find a low point in the Alps and start digging, creating a lowered passage through the mountains to which we can redirect both rivers so they flow freely into each other. This would involve moving a massive amount of rock and then redirecting the rivers to our new channel. But we are humans with a lot of ingenuity, so with enough money and effort, we could do it. Another option is to raise the level of both rivers so that we carry the water and float the ships over the mountains. In effect, we create a water ladder to lift the water and ships over the mountains and then lower them back down the other side. Again, a massive effort. So maybe it would just be easier if we settled with using the passage through the Med and into the Black Sea, rather than trying to reshape the land on such a massive scale. As our friendly beaver says, if it can dam a stream and create a pond, of course humans can connect two major river basins. We just have to put our minds to it. One of the first efforts to connect the Rhine and Danube Basin was done by this guy, Emperor Charlemagne. After all that he had managed to do, how hard could it be to connect the two basins? He ordered the construction of the Fossa Carolina in 793. While there is documentation the project was started, there is no evidence that was ever completed and that the two basins were actually connected. But still, it is an incredible project to conceive for someone in the Middle Ages. 
While the original canal was supposed to be two kilometers long, the conditions of the region were too swampy, and the banks kept collapsing, making construction impossible. However, if you are interested, there's still a 50 meter long portion of the canal that you can visit today. I'm sorry for the mess of my pronunciation, but you can find it in the municipality of Trucklin in the Orstyle known as Graben, or just search for the Fossa Carolina, and you can find this remnant easily. While there continued to be dreams of connecting the Rhine and the Danube, it took a really long time after Charlemagne's failed attempt. The next notable effort to connect the two basins was the Ludwig Canal that was built between 1836 to 1846. Rather than attempting to connect the Rhine River to the Danube River, King Ludwig and his engineers decided to use one of the tributaries, the main river, that came off the Rhine, and then connect that to the Danube. This meant there was less elevation change and a shorter distance than trying to lift the Rhine over the Alps. The Ludwig Canal had an endpoint in the city of Bamberg, which lies in the upper regions of the main river basin. The canal consisted of a dug channel that ran between Bamberg and Kielheim. This canal was fairly narrow and consisted of a series of locks that raised and lowered ships over the Alps. Unfortunately, at the top of the canal, there is often not enough water to carry the ships over the highest point, which of course created challenges for navigation. In addition to the design limitations of the canal, there is another technology that quickly rendered this canal obsolete. While the canal was marginally economically productive for a while, the dispersion of railroads in southern Germany quickly rendered the Ludwig Canal obsolete. It was now possible to move freight and people up and over the Alps year-round along what would become an extensive rail network. While the development of the rail line was the economic end of the Ludwig Canal, the bombing of this region during World War II effectively resulted in the physical end of the canal. While it was not a major transportation hub, it still came under Allied attention and was severely damaged during the war. Following the war, the combination of weak economic return and physical damage led to the canal being no longer repaired and effectively abandoned. While the Ludwig Canal may have been commercially abandoned, it is not completely gone. There are around 60 kilometers of the canal that remain and some of the locks are still operational. While it is no longer a shipping canal, with the presence of the old towpaths that were used to haul ships through the canal still present, the area has become a popular destination for mountain bikers. If you happen to be river cruising and have a day in Nuremberg, you can take a 29.3 kilometer point to point trail that heads out from Nuremberg. While this trail is identified as a bit hilly, you will find yourself passing the canal and getting a taste for what it used to look like. By doing this, you can see what the older canal looked like and can compare it in the new canal that is used today. While there were efforts to update and relocate the Ludwig Canal starting in the 1920s, it was not until the canal was abandoned following World War II that significant efforts were undertaken to relocate and build a new canal connecting the two basins. When they were looking at building the canal, remember, they had to connect the main river with the Danube by getting a water connection up and over the Alps. Let's assume we're taking a cruise ship from the Rhine up the Main. In order to get to the passage over the Alps, we need to climb 175 meters or 574 feet. In order to gain this elevation, the construction engineers installed 11 locks to lift us up to the passage over a saddle in the Alps. Now that we are at the top of the saddle in the Alps, all we have to do is ride the channel down the Danube. And because it is all downhill, of course, we can do this like a log flume ride in an amusement park. The captain would tell us to buckle into our cabins and we would have a really exciting ride down the channel until we get to the Danube. Hang on, 
Here we go. Well, of course, that is not what we do. It would be unsafe for ships of any size, and we also need to be able to get up over this pass from the Danube side. So rather than a log flume, we have another five locks on the Danube side to navigate. Here is an interesting piece of dinner side conversation for you. As you are traveling through the lock system, the Danube side of the river is 107 meters, or 352 feet higher than the main side of the system. Feel free to share that with your table mates. If you have yet to travel through the lock system, it is pretty ingenious. The ship enters one side of the lock and ties off to ensure it stays in one place during the elevation change. The gate then closes behind the ship. The lock fills or empties, adjusting the water level to the next elevation point. Once the two elevation points are equalized, the gates swing open and out you go. It generally takes a few minutes and allows for a rapid movement up and down the canal system. As another interesting trivia point, the 16 locks are managed by remote control from four locations. Each of these locations is staffed by two people during the day and one at night to manage the gates and water levels for transiting ships. For those of you who are numbers oriented, the canal has standard dimensions of 55 meters or 180 feet wide at the water level and a base width of 31 meters or 102 feet. This results in a trapezoidal shape in general for the entire canal. It runs around four meters or 13 feet deep and is 171 kilometers or 106 miles long. The shallowest area of the canal is in Bamberg where the lock has a depth of 2.7 meters, or just under 9 feet. The narrow section of the canal is 43 meters, or 100 feet wide, at the water level. Because of the size of the canal and the locks, there are limitations placed on the size of shipping that can pass through the canal. Ships are limited to 190 meters, or 620 feet long, and 11.5 meters, or 37 feet wide anything bigger, and someone's going to get stuck. Here's another trivia point to share while you are waiting for an excursion. The canal's highest point is 406 meters, or 1,332 feet above sea level. Be careful of altitude sickness. Now, the trivia point is that this is the highest point on Earth reached by commercial ship traffic that is coming directly from the sea. That is so cool. And there we have it, the Rhine, Main, Danube Canal, a modern marvel that connects two watersheds, two basins, and Eastern and Western Europe. It allows for easier shipping of goods and people throughout this part of the continent and flows through some fabulous scenery. Overall, while a man-made waterway, it is also one of the world's great rivers. Thanks for watching.